Access to food is something that's affecting everyone on all different types of demographics, all different walks of life. It's troublesome to me, the richest country in the world, that food pantries even exist in our country. You know, everybody needs access to a grocery store. Everybody eats. I don't mind helping the people in my community and my neighbors. It's so important to make sure that people have food today. Food banks have existed for over 40 years. We've existed that long. And the goal is for us not to need to exist. Sharing a meal is one of the most universal means of connection. Checking out a new restaurant with friends, bringing your favorite family dish to a church potluck, it's hard to think of any kind of gathering that doesn't involve food in some way. Food can signify celebration, culture, and unity. But food is not created equal. Access to fresh and nutritional food is an issue faced across generations and throughout the world. Here in the Show Me State, both urban and rural Missourians struggle with food insecurity, finding themselves in so-called food deserts or areas of low income with low access to fresh food resources, such as a full service grocery store. So what is the current landscape of food insecurity in Missouri? and what's being done to address it. I like to think of food insecurity as having three different components. One component and the most severe sort of condition of food insecurity is hunger, where somebody does not have enough food to eat. Food insecurity also includes people who may technically have enough calories, but aren't able to access enough healthy food. And then the third component of food insecurity includes those who have concerns or worry or anxiety about having enough to eat. African Americans and Hispanics tend to have higher rates of food insecurity on average, as well as female single-headed households with children. The most recent data from the USDA, which did include 2020, so the first year of the pandemic, showed that on average for the general population in the United States, the food insecurity rates did not go up or down. They stayed about the same, which a lot of people found surprising. There's a, a case to be made for the role of the federal supports during that period. So there were expansions related to the SNAP program. And summer food programs were expanded to provide more meals to families. By and large, that stimulus did what it was intended to do in that for many families, their situation did not get worse. However, when you look further into the data, you see that for African-American families, they did have higher rates of food insecurity and families with children. There was sort of an uneven sort of impact with the pandemic. Food insecurity in America has definitely increased due to the pandemic. It's about 10 to 11 percent nationally. Missouri is about 15 percent. Um, the numbers are a little bit hard to pin down. It's sort of a moving target, but we estimate in some of the areas we serve, it's much higher. And that means that about one in six children may not know where their next meal is coming from. The first step to fighting food insecurity in Missouri is awareness understanding the extent and depth of this issue and the impact it has on our state is vital to helping our neighbors and finding community solutions to this difficult and complex situation. The University of Missouri's Center for Food Security is one such group here in Missouri who is helping us understand the scope of food insecurity in our state. In developing their Missouri Hunger Atlas, they provide a county-by-county county snapshot of the situation. Our interdisciplinary Center for Food Security has been around since 2004. And at the time, they were trying to just learn more about hunger in the community, trying to figure out who's hungry, where do they live, in the context of locating a food pantry. The group has been motivated to do that report largely because there is a lack of food insecurity data at the county level. The USDA does an excellent national survey every year. They collect enough data 
so that we can have a national estimate of food insecurity and then state level estimates. The group did a lot of work to understand what types of data could be collected and presented at the county level to basically sort of land on this model that not only presents an estimate for food insecurity at the county level, but also looks at public and private programs that are intended to help those who are food insecure. You know, everybody needs access to a grocery store, but if you're a business owner and you're a small store, you may not have like the buying power and so your costs are gonna be higher, which means you may have to pass those costs on to your customers. If your customers aren't able to afford at those prices, then they may have to shop elsewhere. So in that case, they're not able to support a local grocery store, which can create these pockets where there aren't grocery stores. In our major metro Kansas City, St. Louis areas, and maybe other parts of the state, you know, those places deal with a legacy of redlining where Investment was encouraged in some places and not encouraged in other places based on race. So in that case, it may not necessarily be a, a matter of economics. There are many organizations and communities across the state who make it their mission to utilize creative strategies and provide resources to improve food access in their areas. We spoke with several of them and found unparalleled passion for helping their neighbors. Operation Food Search is a hunger relief organization that provides food, nutrition education, innovative programs, all designed to assist families and children. We serve about 200,000 people every month in the bi-state region, 27 counties in Missouri and Illinois. Our mission at Operation Food Search is to heal hunger through innovative and collaborative solutions that provide immediate food relief and also work to end hunger in the long term. We do that through our three pillars. One is to meet the immediate need for food. The other is to improve nutrition IQ and the third is to champion change. So meeting the immediate need means the food distribution that we're getting out every day to almost 200 community partners. Then we also provide nutrition education and we do that in conjunction with some of our other programs like Metro Market. We have community nutrition staff here at a lot of the stops. It's all designed to get people to be able to stretch their budgets and buy healthy food and put healthy food on the table with limited resources. Finally, Champion Change is all about doing the long-term work to change systems and break down access barriers. So some of that is through policy and advocacy, but a lot of it is about our innovative programs and food as medicine programs. Right now we're in the midst of the Summer Meals Program and that's where we're able to get food to kids 18 and younger who often rely on school meals. We're putting a lot of effort into expanding our reach and making sure that as many children as possible are served. Kids are growing, they're forming their, their brain function, their cognitive function, and there are many studies that show that nutrition at this age is of utmost importance. Our food as medicine programs are called Fresh RX. One is Fresh RX Nourishing Healthy Starts and that is getting meal kits and supportive services to pregnant people and their families to improve birth outcomes. We've seen in our pilot program that it reduces the number of preterm births and children are born at healthier weights. They um, have better health outcomes and it makes so much financial sense. We're making the case basically for food to be a reimbursable health expense. The zip code that we're currently in is one of the most impoverished and underserved communities in the St. Louis region. It is essentially a food desert. There is no access to affordable, quality, nutritious foods in this community. It's, it's processed foods. A lot of them are very expensive. Our, our families just cannot afford nutritious foods. The large prevalence of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, gestational diabetes for our pregnant moms in this community, and all of those chronic diseases are linked to nutrition. 
Uh, so if individuals do not have access again to nutritious foods, vegetables, um, they will not do better with their chronic illnesses. The St. Louis Metro Market and Operation Food Search really fit that need for the community for the nutritious foods. The thing that stands out the most to me about St. Louis Metro Market is that it is culturally competent delivery of care. So the individuals that are on the Metro Market, they know this community, uh, they have the trust of the community, and that's essential. It's nice to have something that's unique that you don't necessarily see in other stores, and that gives them a reason to come. Not only are the prices low, then they can find unique items, uh -huh. you know, like that coat, that, what's that, honey over there? Yeah. For $11.99, it's like $25, $26 for some people, what I've noticed is that they, you know, they, they walk by the bus and they're like, oh, it's just a bus. But then when they walk by that first door and they see pears, peaches, cucumbers, green peppers, they kind of stop and kind of say, what's going on? And so in a way, the Metro Market kind of captures all that level of excitement and passion from folks just by being out there. But when you step on, it really is a transformative space. You know, it's a relationship, and I think that's why the Metro Market has been able to do what it's done over these past seven years is because it's, real, it's intentional. I think that's what it's going to take to really be able to, you know, I guess, to solve some of this food access, food hunger, and insecurity that we're seeing here in St. Louis. It really is an empowering experience to be able to come on and be able to shop for the things that you want. And so to be able to have the Metro Market out on site, to be able to get the things that you need at an affordable price, and know that you save money in the process, I think it's a win-win, you know, for everybody that's involved. From a equity standpoint, from a city standpoint, let's keep continuing, let's keep learning, and let's also keep learning from others as we're going out to these different sites because everybody has a story that really kind of brings together like this, the culture and history that is St. Louis, but also to why food access, not just in any neighborhood, but these neighborhoods in particular are so important. Got elderberries and other orchard trees because uh, again we're practicing some uh, permaculture techniques in addition to the market. Springfield Community Gardens was founded in 2010 so 12 years ago and it wasn't started necessarily as let's fix a problem in the food system. Our director actually was in a class in urban planning and they had to identify a problem and uh, being a single mother at the time she and her group found a neighborhood in the Grant Beach neighborhood that was full of single parents um, that were below the poverty line. They determined as a community uh, that a community garden would be something that was necessary for the space because it would provide you know the supplemental produce that couldn't be found in food pantries or with other organizations came eventually to develop 16 community gardens and three farms, all with the same goal of providing people with fresh produce, but also with education so that others can learn to grow their own. The vision of Springfield Community Gardens is that everyone has access to healthy local food, and a big part of that is preparing people to be the ones growing that healthy local food. A big part of what we do is provide educational opportunities for farmers, for people who maybe don't want to be a farmer, but they just want to know how to grow their own food for their own purposes. So they can learn from those people in the community while they're building relationships and having a great time and, you know, enjoying all of those great endorphins that you get when you have your hands in the soil. Over the past about 20 years, we've seen incredible increases in population growth. Meanwhile, the per capita income for most families is very low. So HUD has actually designated Springfield as the only city in Missouri designated as severely fiscally distressed. And that has contributed to a rising poverty rate as well. We have a poverty rate of about 22.9% in Springfield, and around 67% of individuals have to make the choice between food and utilities every month. The nature of our organization that would target food insecure landscape is that we have a number of our gardens and farms located in food insecure areas. So whether it's our produce distributions, our farm incubator sites, or community gardens, we have a number that are located in people's neighborhoods so that they have ready access to food. Five boxes, we need five boxes. Get, make sure you get the cool one. We have a lot of elders to come through here that's on a limited um, budget, 
and other people that's on limited budgets. So this really helped them get the fresh vegetables and um, fruit that they normally wouldn't get if they didn't come through the food distribution. We got carrots and beets and potatoes. And of course we do the greens, like the lettuce and the collard greens. We got the bell peppers and the, and the onions. Oh, wow, it's so much that we plant back there. We just kind of ask the community what they would like to see. We average out like a thousand uh, individuals a month. In around 75 to 92 families a week. And just to see the smile on the people's face and the joy. This is my calling. And the people really do appreciate the difference that we make in our Weller community. Just in 2021 alone, uh, we distributed 141,000 pounds of produce from our sites, but also in partnership with Ozarks Food Harvest. Uh, we had over 670 volunteers come through last year to our 16 community gardens and three farm sites. Uh, and all of those volunteers donated over 7,000 hours to the community. So that's over 10 hours apiece uh, for all of the volunteers that came through. Uh, our garden sites and our farm sites together uh, produced over 30,000 pounds of produce for those in need last year. Uh, so it's really it's really incredible to see the impact uh, that one organization can have on the local food system. You ever hear the bigger they are, the harder they fall? <laughs> the bigger they are, the harder they catch. We quickly look at the fish. We look at the eye color, the skin color. We just make sure the tone and the texture. So we're going to get him back in some water. But this is how we grow plants with our fish. I'm a farmer, I'm a Missouri farmer. We grow food indoors, so uh, we may not have acres, we might have inches. It was started with my mom, Carol Coe. If you know who she was, she went by Miss Coe, but she was a great advocate for her community, either in representation and politically, or just as a community activist, policy maker, as an attorney. The, the city that she loved so much was Kansas City, Missouri. At the time, was the most underserved community. Miss Coe came here and found these facility, which are greenhouses, at the Kansas City East High School. Mom found the opportunity to look at a food system that was in operation, and it was feeding people in an enormous, sustainable capacity. She saw aquaponics the big fish in the tanks, swimming around in circles, releasing the waste, casting the waste through the system and separating and then growing into plants. And so she saw the system and said, hey, we need this in our community. We need this for our future. We need this for, for education. And we need this to feed. The aquaponics is the science of using fish as a natural organic fertilizer of plants through the resources of water which means what you're doing is you're creating a sustainable environment all the way through. Every step of the environment is dependent upon each other. What we're seeing in our community is the need for food security. It's not people that are food insecure only in food deserts. It's people who are food insecure across the state. Kids are graduating and honestly, they don't have the fields available that they had 20 or 30 years ago. We offer community service credits for volunteering to help us. Students help us with the research on food insecurity. They help us with the opportunities to understand the feedback, what's going on in their communities, and they're becoming a deeper part within the community. So why not be able to create jobs, resources, and education within the community they live in? It makes perfect sense. I really feel like that what we can do is fill in a huge gap between health and nutrition, education, and even the empowerment of organic food. I lost two of my parents 20 to 25 years earlier due to diabetes, heart attacks that were based upon diet. What I get up for are the people who need this the most.
so That's this crazy. is the purple beauty and these are actually real good so this is going to be delicious on the salad uh-huh I got started with, I would guess you would say, just gardening with my grandmother's, Grandma Jo, as I called her. I would help just pull weeds with her, and then we would always go to the city market. When the pandemic hit, Grandma Ruby, I call her, she was like, why don't you grow me some tomatoes? Or why don't you grow some cucumbers? You're not gonna grow anything. The senior living facility that my grandma stays in, I was able to take tons of stuff there and drop it off for them. So it made me see basically how hard it is to get fresh fruits and vegetables. One thing that I'm starting to see that I never seen growing up is going into the grocery store and seeing shelves of items that are bare, right? I've never seen that. The pandemic was something that showed a lot of people that for the first time. For me, that kind of sent off like a red flag that there's something that needs to be done. Four, three, two, one. Uh, a lot of my college friends reached out to me and they were like, whatever we can do to help you succeed and help get this moving, we're gonna help you do it. My location in Memphis was my very first container garden. I think we have about eight 12 by 12s and in there, one of them is nothing but fresh herbs. The Dallas location is a container garden as well. We have about 10 tubs, like the paint containers, you can get them from like Lowe's. And between those, we did tons of tomatoes and cucumbers and onions and some potatoes. From that, she's able to feed her and her son as well as several of the neighbors. The location that is in Pine Bluff, Arkansas is located on campus. Uh, I have a gentleman there named Igwebu. He is the farm manager. So right now we're just doing eggs, but farm fresh eggs as well as tons of vegetables. Uh, we also have goats as well as ducks. So we would eventually like to transfer from just having farm fresh eggs to being full processing and having meat as well. A lot of times when people think of a farm, they're thinking way out, you know, in the country, acres and acres of land. The difference is, is you can be in a small area and you still can get the same harvest and the same impact as someone who has acres and acres of land. I believe if everyone just gets started, so we have a community here. Now, what if the block over does the same thing? And maybe they don't have 10 people, but maybe they have four. Okay, that's still enough to support their block. In return, all of this access for three or four blocks, everyone's household is gonna have sufficient food. It's a lot different when people that don't live in an area say what an area needs, right? But it's different when you're living in the area and you see what's needed yourself. Senator Doug Beck represents part of the St. Louis area and is currently working to pass a bill in the Missouri Senate which would provide tax incentives to grocery stores that open in food deserts, or what the USDA has now termed as low-income, low-access areas. As explained by Bill McKelvey, the term food desert doesn't paint the most accurate picture of what the term is trying to label that in nature, a desert is a naturally occurring ecosystem, and there's nothing natural about a food desert. With push from community food advocates, the USDA is phasing out the term food desert and adopting low income, low access as a more accurate descriptor of these areas. criteria or the definition of a cold service grocery store is one that has fresh fruits and vegetables, uh, meats, dairy, uh, canned goods, all those things, and household products. A lot of times in the urban areas they may have to go to, to a convenience store or, or a liquor store to get their food. Most time they're not going to find fresh fruits and vegetables, they're not going to find those products. They're also going to pay a higher price than we pay at the grocery store. And then in a rural area, it would be within a 10 mile radius. And during a committee in economic development, we had that first hearing, some of the reps would come up to me and go, I gotta drive 20 minutes and go to a gas station. It would be a tax credit for building or remodeling a place that's in a 
what they call a food desert by federal definition. A certain criteria would be if you're in like the city of St. Louis, first class, Charter County, uh, Kansas City, it basically spells it out that a, that a full service grocery store should be within a half mile of folks because a lot of times they don't have transportation. For example, if we put a full service grocery store in an area, now you've created some development there. You possibly will spur something else on to pop up around there. Once you get a sense of community and some things back in there, you know, you can create development, but we're not gonna be able to create development if we don't actually incentivize it. You know, not just building gas stations and things of that nature, but you'll have true economic activity that'll help people. I think overall, it just has this effect, a ripple effect if you do things like this. And it's the right thing to do in my mind. In the last few years, there's been a handful of bills introduced in the Missouri State Legislature aimed at providing better food access and availability. One of the bills passed allows Missourians to use their SNAP benefits at farmer's markets. Another provides incentives for new urban farming operations. In addition, Missouri Governor Mike Parson assembled a food security task force in July of 2021, comprised of over two dozen members who represent a wide array of backgrounds, from education to food production, policy to nonprofits, with the intent of evaluating the impact of food insecurity in the state and the strategies to improve the situation. Now, even the state recognizes that that's an important opportunity that we could be taking advantage of to incentivize urban farmers. And now we can really go about it and navigate the channels better and more efficiently. And that's what that task force is designed to do, is to look at systems, not only that are broken, but look at some systems that are working and maybe align some of the resources. And that's what we're advocating for. It's a great task force because it reflects a lot of diversity, a lot of different industries. We're blessed to represent Green Acres Urban Farm and Research Project there not only just as a farm, but being able to have a voice at the table to really just say, you know, from an uh, agricultural African-American perspective, this is important to our people. And our project is important, not just to our people, but to everybody. We aren't sure what the future holds, but here are ways these people and organizations feel they can be part of the solution Programs are most successful when they can involve the people who are most affected by the issue. You can't deny the numbers when eight, over 800,000 people are, are food insecure in, in Missouri. You know, that's, you know, that's over 10% of the population, right? What can we do policy-wise? What can we do in our state and in our communities so that folks can earn a good living, support their families? Really, they don't have to be reliant on the safety net program in the first place. The systems that are in place that have caused this to be the reality in so many communities are very complicated and very long-standing and they can only be changed through a lot of cooperation and making sure we know what communities need and that we're asking them what we need and we're not going on a sort of old model of telling people what we're going to do for them. We're all putting our, our minds together on this and able to listen to each other. That's how we're going to make real progress. It's really a must that everyone starts growing something. Just me being here, that's five households that have access. Grow one thing and get good at that one thing. And then maybe if your neighbor grows something else, you guys can trade, you know? When you look at the research related to community gardening, what tends to kind of come out on top in terms of providing the greatest impact are the community impacts. People get to know one another, so you're working with and meeting people who are not necessarily within your kind of immediate friend or family group. You have all of these benefits from an activity like community gardening that are really like in addition to the food. We're really trying to bring this growing atmosphere back into our own backyards. And we can do that through the community gardens, but we can also do it on a larger scale through a farm incubator program. We understand that we can go higher and higher and reach more and more people. Our ideal would be to have Green Acres urban farmer research projects all over the state of Missouri. 
from a rural area to a, a urban area, and then maybe have these guys cross communicate and talk about best practices. You know, the Metro market can become a part of the cultural fabric of St. Louis. So the same way we talk about Cardinals, the same way we talk about the Blues, Emos, and all those things, when folks see that green bus driving down the highway, they're like, oh, I need to follow it to wherever it's going. We have a long way to go. And we get it. It's hard to not feel discouraged when we think of the amount of need in our Missouri communities. But it's our hope that we look at these people, these organizations, at the dedication found in these individuals who care so much about helping their neighbors and feel a little more optimistic about the future. Or maybe you'll feel empowered to volunteer your time or talents to improve food security and access here in our state. We would like to try and change systems and create structures where people are empowered to put food on the table themselves, they're empowered to have better health outcomes because they have access to the food that they need. You know, if, if it's not the Metro Market, if it's not Operation Food Search, find an organization out there that's really doing the work in your communities. Volunteer some of those hours, those thoughts, get on a board, committee, do something. Um, because I think, you know, once we all kind of pitch in into doing that, I think we're going to see a better thrive in St. Louis. So if you just want to be a cheerleader, just to be a part of that community, of the Springfield Community Garden, we would love to have you. A lot of people, until they've been hungry, you know, you might not even think about it, you know, because you've never been in that position. That's why it's so important, you know, for everyone to start growing, as well as I felt the need to go ahead and try to take on this task because we totally 100% rely on someone else to feed us, right? And that's scary because at any time, what if that person or that corporation can't feed you? If I can encourage you to start your own farm, to invest in your own land and grow food for your own family, we need everybody to take that step. And then we need them to take another step to sustainability. And that means educating yourself on best practices. I mean, so we're having fun too. This is not all business, guys. But we're all having fun connecting the community and getting those smiles, that laughter over food. We are definitely seeing a lot of positive things and reasons to be hopeful. We see that people are much more aware of food insecurity now since the pandemic. They realize that it's often circumstances beyond people's control. It can happen to anyone. So when we're talking about neighborhoods with limited food access, we're talking about neighborhoods that don't have access to a grocery store that are within a mile radius. So being able to add that food access component to that work really begins to blend that healthcare food access work together and really allows us to be able to provide one-stop shop opportunities here in the neighborhoods. And so now when somebody's going to get their checkup, they can go get their groceries all at the same place. Hey, we can do this as a community and we can take care of the high-end restaurants, we could take in the schools, we could take care of the nurseries, we could take care of the, the, the communities of need, and we can make access and affordability go hand in hand. I don't mind helping the people in my community and my neighbors, you know, they would knock on my door, Chris, what you got over there? <laughs> in what small part we make, everybody can make a small difference in somebody's life.